We all know what this is. We're bombarded with images like this every day. It comes into our homes, through our televisions, through our computers. And unfortunately, we've become pretty immune to their effects. We see these every day. But imagine that you lived in the US 150 years ago. If you did, you probably lived on a farm with your extended family. You might be able to read. Um, most of your news you would get by word of mouth. Or if you were very lucky, perhaps you got the Harper's Weekly. The Harper's Weekly gave you, no, gave you news from all over the place and gave you kind of an idea of what was going on beyond the realm of your own immediate farm, so to speak. Um, and oftentimes people couldn't read very well, and Harper's Weekly had a lot of illustrations, which would also help people kind of understand the spirit of what was going on. Um, but their illustrations were usually rather abstract. You might, uh, the, the closest you would get to seeing actual war footage, etc., would be basically a fellow maybe standing there with a gun. But imagine that one week you got your Harper's, and instead of seeing this, you saw something more like this. photos are the work of Mr. Matthew Brady, and his work before and during the American Civil War laid bare the harsh reality of war, of war and gave us the beginnings of photojournalism. This is Mr. Brady. Um, I found Brady uh, when I was in Chicago. I was cast in a show that was about the Civil War poetry of Walt Whitman. It's called The Wound Dresser. And every backdrop in this show was a Matthew Brady photograph, so I became fascinated with it. And with good reason, because um, the biographical notes on Brady published by the Library of Congress said that he had a great and lasting effect on the art of photography. His war scenes demonstrated that photographs could be more than posted portraits, and his efforts represent the first instance of the comprehensive photo documentation of a war. So, although most Americans today have never heard his name, Matthew Brady's work affected not only the people of the United States and the Confederate States of America in the 1800s, but he gave us a one man's conceptual view of history in the birth of photojournalism. Um, now we will be demonstrating the validity of this uh, by focusing on his work before the conflict, during the Civil War, and the legacy that he leaves behind. So let's begin by looking at Brady before the Civil War. He came to New York as a young man and became very interested in photography and the, the main type of photography that was being done at the time was called daguerreotyping. And he became a daguerreotypist and he was very talented. He was also someone who was very good at promoting himself and he figured, I'm going to get the faces that are pertinent of our time down to posterity and I'm going to make a lot of money doing it. And so he started chasing people. He was going after the wealthy, the famous, the illustrious persons of his day. And he started to get them to sit for him. He got Charles Dickens to sit for him. Um, he got uh, Daniel Webster. He got Mark Twain, Jenny Lind, who was known as the Swedish Nightingale. And after a while, he didn't have to go after people. People went after him, because suddenly it was like saying you had arrived to have your picture made by Mr. Brady. And this goes right up to Abraham Lincoln. When Abraham Lincoln came to New York, to give his famous speech at the Cooper Union, that's the speech that basically won him the Republican nomination for president. That very day, he came in to Brady's on Broadway and sat for Matthew Brady. And this is a very important photograph. According to, um, to uh, Smithsonian's video entitled Matthew Brady's Vision, uh, the National Portrait Gallery's David Ward, who was curator of One Life, The Mask of Lincoln, had said about this portrait that it's very interesting because it shows a very impressive figure of a man who could be president, who you should vote for. And afterwards, Lincoln himself said that Mr. Brady and the Cooper Union may be president. So Brady was very famous before the Civil War. He had a lot of cachet. Now, once the war started, he saw an opportunity to go and record history. Now his wife, his friends, they said, don't do this, you've got a really nice practice here in the city. And Brady's famous quote was, I had to go. A spirit in my feet said, go. And I went. And he really did go. He went into the field. And not only did he go into the field, he duplicated himself. 
he got his, he got, he hired a series of 18 men. He taught them how he liked to have photographs taken, what they should photograph, and he armed them with these. It's called a what's it wagon. That's what the Union troops called it. And what it is, it's a portable darkroom. And so this cadre of men went to all the battles, and they were all shooting under the name of Matthew Brady. And they sent their stuff back, and Brady's stuff began to be exhibited and published. And it was very, very powerful. Um, when he had his first exhibit of his work, which took place at his gallery in New York, um, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. Uh, came to see it. He was the father of the Supreme Court Justice, who we all know as Oliver Wendell Holmes. And after seeing the exhibit, Mr. Holmes said, let him, who wishes know, uh, let him who wishes to know what war is like, look at this series of illustrations. The honest sunshine gives us some conception of what a repulsive, sickening, hideous thing it is, this dashing together of two frantic mobs to which we give the name of armies. So the pictures that this man took and his people took brought the war right into our faces. Now, after the war, life was not very kind to Brady, but posterity has been. Um, his life post-war, according to the International Photography Hall of Fame's archives, tells us that Brady was forced to declare bankruptcy. You see, he figured during the war that he would be able to sell his body of work to the government, but the government didn't really want it right away. And so he wound up declaring bankruptcy in 1875. But then the government finally said, yeah, maybe we will buy it, and they bought his whole catalog for $25,000, and I know that sounds like a heck of a lot of money at that time, but when you consider that Matthew Brady put out of his own pocket $100,000, he was in trouble. Um, so financially, his work for the war was a failure for him, but it was tremendously important for us because for the first time in history, history is not being told to us, it's being shown to us. Um, and his creative model for getting this job done, it, it, one guy in a portrait studio suddenly becomes an entire troop of men going everywhere and capturing everything. Um, so looking back at his life and work, we can begin to understand the scope of Matthew Brady's place in history. Uh, first of all, the pre-war, establishing himself as a famous portrait artist, gaining that power so that everyone knew who he was before the war even started. During the war, bringing it right into our doorsteps, and leaving it there for us to see and think about. And finally, he brought photography out of the sterile setting of a studio. He changed forever how news comes to the masses. So Matthew Brady gave us a window into the horror of a house temporarily divided against itself. His visionary use of photography, both as art and informer, as well as his talent for self-promotion, and the ability to duplicate his efforts in the field gave us the first comprehensive visual coverage of current world events. So the next time you're catching the evening news, or you're going online to find out what's happening in the streets of Cairo, or even if you're just going onto YouTube to you know, relive uh, Derek Jeter hitting his 3,000th home run, just take a minute and appreciate these latest fruits of Matthew Brady's work. Are there any questions? So you, you consider him like a paparazzi of his time, when he was beginning? Absolutely, he was the original paparazzi. Was the paparazzi. But people weren't, the thing is, people weren't affronted by his presence, though. Because even if you were on the battlefield and you were uh, just hanging with your friends, they wanted to have their picture. Well, I mean, in his, uh, in his uh, beginnings, not during the war, but yeah, he, he, with, uh, he basically kind of annoyed people into sitting for him. So he was pretty much like a paparazzi man in his earlier stage in life. Yes, you could absolutely say that. Are there any other questions? Yes. Do you think like there's one main picture that they made him? One main picture? Like, was there one main picture that made him is the question. Um, he has such a vast catalog of pictures that if I was to stick I could stick probably 50 pictures of his up on the screen. And you would go, I know that picture, or I've seen that picture. And every time you go, yeah, of course I've seen that. That's Frederick Douglass, I've seen that. He was also, if, if you're talking about his favorite topic, perhaps, besides the war itself, he was Lincoln's favorite photographer. 
he photographed Lincoln and Lincoln's family more than anybody else. That famous last portrait of Lincoln with the broken glass, the broken plate, you know, was taken the week before he died. That was taken at Brady's studio in Washington. The picture of Lincoln sitting there uh, reading, looking at a photo album with his son Tad, you know, the little boy standing next to Lincoln while he's sitting. That's a Matthew Brady picture. So perhaps his favorite topic aside from the war was Lincoln. Any other questions? That's wonderful.